Welcome to the Reiki Gateway Podcast with Reiki Masters Kathleen Johnson and Andrea Kennedy. Journey with us and let's explore what lies beyond the Reiki Gateway. Hello and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Reiki Gateway. This is Kathleen Johnson and I'm here with my co-host Andrea Kennedy. Today's episode will help anyone interested in how to navigate the myriad options available for Reiki training. We're going to talk about what's out there, how to choose, and some pitfalls that you may need to be aware of. But before we get into that, we have some really exciting news to share. For those of you who may not know, our podcast reached 10,000 downloads over the weekend. We are over the moon about this because not only does it tell us that you have listened to our episodes 10,000 times, but honestly, we did it in seven months. And that is all due to you, the listeners. Our hearts are full and we are so grateful for your support. So I couldn't let another moment pass without mentioning that. Thank you so much. That's right, Kathleen. It is such an exciting time for us here beyond the Reiki Gateway because we started this podcast and we just wanted to be helpful. We wanted to offer something to listeners who might have questions about Reiki and other things. It feels just fabulous to know that some people out there are engaged and hopefully benefiting from what we talk about with each other. So it is super exciting. Today's episode is all about Reiki training. And I do think that a lot of what we say today will actually translate to other modalities if you're considering other modalities. So even though we're talking about Reiki today, if you're interested in other types of training, I think a lot of this will apply to you as well. We received a question from a listener And he wrote in because he was interested in finding out more about Reiki and selecting what kind of training to take. And as he got looking out there in his local area and then online, he said it was pretty overwhelming and he ended up just stopping in his tracks and he reached out for some advice about what to consider and had questions about in-person versus online and so many other things. And so we're just going to delve into that with you. I think Kathleen and I do have a lot to say about this topic. So I hope you'll stick around and explore this with us today. What comes to my mind first is this whole idea between in-person and online. A lot of teachers have gone online to practice. Given difficulty with travel and in-person things lately, you know, I think maybe that's the first question that we should talk about. What about in-person versus online? What do you think about that? Well, Andrea, what I think is, first of all, if you're choosing an in-person class, you have a couple of options. You have someone who is local, perhaps, and that's a good thing if you have a qualified teacher who's local to where you live. Or you may find one who's a little bit further away, and that involves some travel, maybe a lot of travel, depending on what you're looking for. But I think the question, at least for us today, is more about how in-person classes compare and contrast to online classes. Because with online classes, there are so many choices. We have, well, we have webinars. We have the live online classes, similar to what you're teaching now. And there's also YouTube classes. (laughs) I know, right? There are a lot of things from which to choose. And I think... It's helpful for people who are trying to navigate all these choices to have a better understanding of what it is they need to keep an eye out for, to look for, questions to ask, so that they can make the choices that are right for them. Because what person A is looking for may not be right for person B. So I think it's important, though, to know what's out there and how to go about choosing. There sure are a lot of options, Kathleen, especially when we look online. And a lot of people have turned online as a result of the pandemic because they still want to learn and they want to engage and they're still seeking 
to learn Reiki and be able to practice Reiki and help themselves and their families. Reiki is a pretty big deal to me, and I think you'd agree as well. And I don't take Reiki training lightly at all. When somebody decides they're interested in learning Reiki, what do you think is a main question to ask themselves? One of the main questions is, first of all, is this right for me? (laughs) Because like you, I take Reiki and Reiki training and the practice of Reiki very seriously. I have often said to my students, I don't take myself seriously. I try not to, but I take Reiki very seriously. I think it is something that deserves respect and reverence. Anyone who's interested in Reiki training, I think, needs to do a little oh, introspection. Is this right for me? How do I want to incorporate Reiki into my life? If it is, what do I want to do with it? And then take it from there. And as you said, there's so many options out there and it really gets confusing. So when it comes down to it, what you're looking for is quality. Now, quality means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but you want quality. You want to find a quality program taught by a quality teacher. And by that, I mean a teacher who is qualified, has the appropriate training to teach, uh, someone who is experienced, someone who hopefully has taught classes before, has a little bit of, you know, experience doing this, and someone who really, really loves Reiki and loves teaching it and expanding the use and the training of Reiki to as many people as possible. That's the whole idea, to get it out there and have more and more people using Reiki all the time. So it's about the quality. And at the end of the day, I think that comes down to the teacher. I don't know how you feel about that, Andrea, but to me, the quality begins and ends with the teacher. I agree with that, Kathleen, because I think that, you know, Reiki is a system of healing and there are certain elements that all quality Reiki training should have, like the history, like practice and instruction of different techniques, as well as the attunement. And Reiki is unique in that we can't just read a book and become a Reiki practitioner. It does require the attunement process in order for a person to be able to say that they are a Reiki practitioner. And whether the training is online or in person or on any of the various platforms or styles of how you would teach a Reiki class, either in person or online, the common denominator is the course content. But how that's delivered and how the teacher engages with the student and supports the student along the way I think is really critical because Reiki is mysterious and questions will arise as someone practices Reiki. And to have a connection with the master teacher, I believe, is very important for the success, whether the student is going to practice just for themselves or share Reiki with other people. So I think you bring up a good point about having them think about how they might be utilizing Reiki as they move forward. Is this going to just be a self-practice? Is this something they want to give more time to as far as sharing it with others? Or is this something that they might even consider teaching in their future? And of course, I realize many people as they start out, like I did, you know, I had no idea I was ever going to teach Reiki. So, of course, a student might change their perception and their relationship with Reiki as they progress. And that's certainly expected and welcomed. But I believe if you start your Reiki training with a good, solid teacher, a good foundation, that is going to be most helpful for the student to move forward in positive ways and be thankful that they made the decision to take Reiki training. Yes, absolutely. And I agree wholeheartedly. It's really about the teacher and not so much the platform, Um, online or in person. As I've said to you a few times, there's online training and then there's online training. (laughs) There's in-person training and then there's in-person training. There was a range of 
quality in all of those things. That is where discernment needs to come into play. And also asking questions of a potential teacher. Now, I know that when I schedule a class, and if it's with students that I don't know, which is pretty frequently, as you know, I always encourage them to reach out to me either via email or text or even by phone and ask me questions about my background, my experience, my training, all those things, because I want them to know what they're getting, know what they're signing up for, if you will. And I think that's really important. And I'm always very clear about, look, if you really want to learn Reiki, that's great. It doesn't have to be with me. Just be sure you find a teacher that is right for you. Now, that can mean a lot of different things, right? You can find the most qualified teacher in your area or beyond, but you may not really, you know, sync with that person. You may not feel that this person is in alignment with your energy, and that's okay. I've had students occasionally that I felt were not in alignment, we were not in alignment with each other. Let's put it that way. And it happens. So I think there has to be a little bit of a contact between the teacher and the potential student. At least that's the way I approach it. Um, and I know when you teach, Andrea, your philosophy about teaching is very similar to mine. I always view myself as a spiritual guardian after I've taught Reiki. I don't do a hit-and-run Reiki class, you know. I'm available for students to contact me even years later if they have questions or concerns or need help with something. I know you do the same, and that's why I say spiritual guardian. I'm there if you need me, and I'll do my best to help how I can because I take this responsibility very seriously. So I think it's important for any potential Reiki students to do their homework and find someone who is qualified and experienced and with whom they feel in sync with. They hit it off. And that is hard to explain, but when it happens, you know what it is, right? Yeah. And this is fun to talk to you about because I too, you are right. I don't abandon my students after class. You talk about the spiritual guardian thing and years later getting questions. And it's funny, just the other day, I was sitting on my couch answering an email from someone. And I thought, when I'm 90, am I going to be doing this? I had to chuckle because I thought, yeah, probably somebody's going to be uh, <laughs> texting me or emailing me or who knows how we're going to communicate then. But I think it's so important to not leave our students hanging, right? We're a resource to them. That's how I view that. And if they have given me the honor of being their Reiki master teacher. I make it a point to not abandon them. No Reiki orphans for us, Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. And it's funny that you say you were writing an email to a student over the weekend. I, too, received, it was actually a message on a social media platform from a student I taught three years ago with a question about something she wanted to do. And I was happy to hear from her and I was happy to answer her question. So yeah, I think that's important. And that goes into the whole searching for the Reiki teacher that is right for you. Is this person going to be there for you if you need her or him when the class is over? And if it's somebody that maybe you feel won't be, but you feel like you need that extra level of um, support, then you need to keep on looking. And I know from teaching Reiki, and I know, Andrew, you've been teaching Reiki longer than I have, there are some students who very much just run with it. They just learn it, and they run with it, and they're great. And you may never hear from them again because they run with it. That's the only way I can describe it. But then there are students who need a little bit more hand-holding. They need a little bit more care and a little bit more support. And then there's everybody in between. So I think, you know, we have to just accommodate the students and allow the space to give them what they need. Haven't you had students take your class that have come and said, I've already had this level of Reiki training, but I don't feel like... 
I had a really good class. I had a lot of questions still left. And I decided when I found your class that I wanted to retake it with you. Have, has that happened to you? It has. And it's happened more often than I expected. And again, I, I don't want to keep comparing the way we teach, but I think you and I have very similar teaching styles. I know your classes are a full day. So are mine. I have had students who have come to me and say, look, I've had Reiki one or two or whatever. It was a short class and I feel like I still have a lot of questions. So I would like to take the class with you. Is that okay? And of course, I mean, I'm, I'm always happy to do so. But again, I think it comes down to finding the right teacher. If you find the right teacher, there's a really good chance that the teacher's curriculum is going to be right for you as well. It, they kind of go hand in hand. At least that's what I've found. I don't know about you, Andrea, but that's what I've experienced in my journey through teaching Reiki. Yes, exactly. I've had students come to take my class and they say that they had Reiki one and it was about two hours or three hours. And I'm a little bit shocked at that because I don't know how you can convey all the important things about Reiki level one in such a short amount of time. So I think that you're absolutely right about that. A quality teacher knows that it takes time in order to engage with the student to teach them the content. There is content in these courses. It isn't about showing up, talking for a half an hour about Reiki and getting an attunement. Uh, because then the student leaves the class and they don't even know what to really do after that. So it takes the guidance of a teacher to be able to explain, to demonstrate, and to also incorporate practice in the class. I mean, Reiki is a practice. And I'm aware sometimes there are classes out there and the students, even in person, they don't even get an opportunity to practice with the other students and then they leave the class. And to me, to provide a quality class, it takes lecture uh, about the information about the course content. And it also takes practice and experience because Reiki is so experiential that I just believe that for someone to leave a Reiki class, they must have experience with the energy before they receive their certificate and go out into the world and say that they're a Reiki practitioner. And I want to also bring up that word practitioner. I saw it lately online and somebody was asking, what does that mean? And in my world, once someone takes a Reiki one course, a, a quality Reiki one course and goes out into the world, they can call themselves a Reiki practitioner because they are practicing Reiki. Even if it's just self Reiki, they're still practicing it. They're engaging with the energy and they are practicing with it. That's my definition of practitioner. Would you have anything to add to that, Kathleen? Yes, and you make a very good point when you talk about the experiential portion of Reiki in a class. I think that is not only important, it's essential. It's absolutely essential. In fact, I've noticed in my classes that this is where students tend to get hung up. If a student is going to get hung up and experience a lot of self-doubt and lack of confidence, it's going to be in the experiential portion of the class. Uh, some students tend to get very focused unnecessarily on the mechanics of it, and I have to work with them through that. And then there are students who are very nervous and are convinced that they're the first persons in the world who will not be able to channel Reiki, <laughs> but they will be the first ever, you know? Right. Um, so mm -hmm. that is the point in the training where you really need to offer the support to students, learning about the history, what Reiki is, you know, providing that foundation, that's great. But most people don't get too worried about that part. They get that. It's a lecture. Okay, they learned it. They understand it. The fear and the self-doubt and the confusion comes into play during the experiential portion. I feel it's, I'm going to use the word irresponsible, to have a Reiki class and not have an experiential portion. 
because how are the students going to know if what they're doing is right? And of course, we know we can't do Reiki wrong, but new students don't really believe that at first. They really need that support. At least that's been my experience with teaching Reiki. Experience is key because to me, that is the make or break element that will lead a student to either feel confident and succeed with Reiki or will feel less than confident. That student is more prone to not practice after class. They'll doubt themselves. They'll have questions. They perhaps lack the connection with the teacher because they didn't have any experience in the class with the teacher guiding them in those sort of situations. And so they will be in isolation and then the Reiki will fall to the side and they won't practice it. And that's a real shame. I think as a teacher, I want my students to succeed after the class. I want my class for them to be as real world as possible. You know, when you leave this class, how are you going to do self Reiki after you leave a Reiki two class? How do you share Reiki with someone else? How do you talk about Reiki to someone else? You know, let's practice that. Let's talk about it. Let's be practical. So taking Reiki back into their lives, if they have no idea how to do that, I think they're set up a bit for failure on the Reiki path. And something led them to that class. Something guided them to learn Reiki. And I just see it as my responsibility to do my part and to support them so that they're successful with it. Yes, and I have too found that that's what happens with students who don't have that support. Reiki tends to fall by the wayside with them. They don't keep up with it. They have so many questions and feel they don't have the tools they need to successfully practice Reiki, whether it's on themselves, their family or friends or their pets or their plants or whatever, it just gets sort of set aside. I think that is so, so sad because Reiki is available mm -hmm. to everyone. It is meant to be available to everyone. It is a gift from spirit. And the idea is to expand the reach of Reiki, to get it to as many people as possible, to raise the vibration and the frequency, not only of the individual practitioners, but the collective energy. And for people that just say, oh, this doesn't work for me, or I don't think I know how to do this, and just let it fall to the side, I find that very sad. Yeah, and I'd like to just put some practicality to this and circle back to the question that our listener had. So if he decided, okay, I want a quality teacher then, or if he was listening to us here in, in real time, what action would he take with that? He might search online for Reiki training near me or something like that. He might look around at his local metaphysical bookstores or things like that, look for brochures or flyers for classes locally if he's interested in a local class. But then I do think that the internet is a good place to to go to, especially if you don't know anyone who has a word of mouth sort of recommendation for a teacher. You might search up a teacher online, even if they're in your own community. You might see if they have reviews, but of course, that's just one little one little nugget of information because there are great teachers out there that won't have any reviews. So you could see if they have reviews, you could see if they have a website and see what you think about their website. If they do, what kind of vibration or feeling do you get from their website? What do they have there as far as their training? Do they describe their training? Again, you know, it's going to take time to learn Reiki. Uh, hopefully more than just a couple of hours. Again, going back to quality, maybe they have social media accounts. You can check those out. What are your impressions of the teacher there? They might be on YouTube. You can check them out there. A lot of Reiki teachers will put themselves out there because they want to teach and they want to reach people interested in Reiki. They love Reiki. I know for myself, I'm pretty transparent. I want people just to get to know me and where I'm coming from because 
I think that that helps them decide if I'm the right fit for them for a teacher. Let's just get clear on do we resonate or do we not? The more we're out there, the more chance we have for potential students to be able to get to know us and know if we're right for them. Exactly. And I think it's important, as you said, to be transparent. I am not really on social media much these days for a lot of reasons. Um, I used to be on there a whole lot more than I am nowadays. <laughs> but I have a website and I am very transparent about my training and my background on that. And I've had more than one person, actually quite a few, comment on how helpful that was because they feel like they had a little bit of a sense of who I was just by checking out my website. And I'm sure that that's true of yours as well, Andrea. And I think that's important. No matter how much or how little we choose to put ourselves out there, we have to be transparent. And another way that people can start looking for the right Reiki teacher for them is through word of mouth. I mean, do they know anyone who has Reiki or has taken a Reiki class with someone or heard a chance remark by someone. You know how spirit works. Sometimes it's just something you overhear and it's mm -hmm. going to go, ooh, you know. But word of mouth is really important too because then if you know someone who's taken a class with a certain teacher, you can get a lot of information just from that. So I think the bottom line here is to do your homework, right? Uh, go online. I think that's a great place to start. Absolutely. The internet is a wealth of information, sometimes a little too much, but when you're looking for a teacher, I think you have all this information available, but you got to use your own internal guidance as well. And another way that that internal guidance might help would be to go have Reiki sessions in your community, right? Go meet people in your community that are practicing Reiki and offering sessions. They might not teach but if you go to a practitioner and have a session and you really like the practitioner, the session was really great, you can always ask them, hey, you know, do you teach? And if they don't, well, who is your teacher? Would you recommend them? So that's a whole nother avenue. And I'll share one little quick story about mm -hmm. finding the right teacher. I was at home one day and my phone rang and I picked it up and there was a lovely lady on the other end. And... When I said hello, she asked, is this, is this Andrew? And I said, no, it's Andrea. And I thought that was a little bit odd. And you know what happened? She had Googled to find a Reiki teacher. And this teacher's name was Andrew something. Well, she went to call this other teacher about taking his class. And guess what? She dialed my phone number. What are the odds of that? We talked on the phone and hit it off. We couldn't believe the strange wire crossing of the universe. And she took my class and I mean, she's a delight. And I just look back at that and how spirit worked to bring us together. And uh, pretty amazing, don't you think? That is so true. Uh, that's a perfect example of how spirit is going to help us out as long as we're open to it. We've talked about that a lot recently in our more recent episodes. And that's a perfect example. What are the chances of something like that happening? Probably pretty slim. So obviously the student was meant to come to you. And the universe said, okay, let's move a few things around here and make that happen, right? Yeah, it was really amazing. It, we just chuckled about it for years after that, how all the little things that had to happen for the phone to ring on my end. But there's a teacher for everyone. There's a method for everyone that is right, that is appropriate. And we said something earlier, and I think it is important enough to circle back to, and that is the path of the student will often change and grow over time. I know when I first learned Reiki, I still had a lot of questions, but then later I had guidance to go retake my training. And I think a lot of students do that and they might take it with different teachers. They might take different styles of Reiki, different things like that. And all of that's wonderful. It's more learning. But I guess my point is that 
what we envision our Reiki path to be in the beginning, it may end up to be something very, very different. I never planned to teach Reiki when I first learned all those years ago. I never saw myself doing this. And it's probably a good thing because I just went along doing my own little practice and one thing led to another. So we can often not foresee where Reiki will guide us. And do you find, Kathleen, that some people feel like Reiki training means they have to go all the way and teach it? Yes, and I have found that to be surprisingly more prevalent than I would have initially thought. And just as an aside, I, too, had no intention of ever teaching Reiki when I right. first started learning. I thought, oh, no, no way. <laughs> well, we all know how that worked out. But anyway, yes, to answer your question, I've had students who thought that if they took the master teacher training, that they were then obligated to teach Reiki, and they were then reluctant to take the teacher training because of that. So honestly, I had that misconception crop up for me so many times, I began to incorporate a little bit about that in my Reiki 1 classes when I discuss the different levels of Reiki and what's involved in each one. I make it very, very clear that should a person decide to go for the full master training, they are eligible to teach Reiki, but by no means are they required to. Now, I will say that, of course, people are encouraged to teach Reiki, but I frequently say the Reiki police aren't going to come to your door and force you to teach Reiki. It doesn't work that way. And I think that has helped a lot of people feel a little more comfortable with taking that training. And, you know, let's be honest, each one of us has our own strengths and our own limitations. Not everyone is cut out to be a teacher. It is just the way it is. Everybody has their own set of wonderful gifts to offer. Not all of them are teaching, right? I have teaching background prior to Reiki. I know you do too, Andrea. Teaching is always something I've enjoyed and really, really loved, actually. But I know that not everyone shares that. So I think it is misguided to assume that everyone who takes the master teacher training is going to be a good Reiki teacher. Because I think you really need to love Reiki and love teaching it in order to be an effective teacher. Yes, when I took my master training, the teacher component was incorporated in it. It was one class. And I know some teachers and some styles, they break it into two parts. So there's a master practitioner and also a master teacher. So a student could stop after master practitioner and never even take the teacher. But for classes that are more combined, like the ones that we teach, master, teacher, it's all one class, I had no problem actually thinking I'm never going to teach this, but I'm taking the class anyway because I do everything fully. You know, I go all the way and then I'll just kind of leave behind whatever I don't want to pick up, so to speak. So that was my plan with the master class. It's like, oh, I'm getting... Reiki master because I wanted to have access to all the Reiki energy I could possibly have. I wanted all the tools in my toolbox and then I just wouldn't teach, right? But you bring up such a great point. Not everybody's cut out to be a teacher or meant to be a teacher. It just doesn't resonate with them. It's not on their life path. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's so many things that I don't go do just because it doesn't resonate with me. And I think that's true with everybody. I don't think that that whole teacher bit is enough at all to hold anybody back from taking a master level class that also has the teaching part in it. Access all that you can in regards to Reiki and whatever doesn't resonate with you, like being a teacher, just set that aside. There's nothing wrong with that. And the other bit about that that I want to say, I think is really important, is not everybody's meant to have a Reiki business and do this full time either. I've had students that have thought that if they didn't open a professional practice, that was somehow a failure or something. No, you know what? 
the world needs Reiki practitioners, people just with the energy practicing, inviting Reiki into their life regularly. We need those people in every profession. We need those people in every walk of life. So it isn't about opening a Reiki practice for clients and doing this full time at all. Again, if that resonates with you, great. But be a Reiki practitioner in your normal life. That's what it's all about is Reiki blends with who you are and helps you tune in to what your passions are. And Reiki will be with you every step of the way, whatever that is. And that is a beautiful thing. Very well said, Andrea. Absolutely. Uh, Reiki is always going to be with the person who has learned Reiki and been attuned to it. But it's so, so important to honor yourself, honor who you are. And if the teaching path is something that resonates for you, by all means, go for it. If a professional practice resonates with you, go for it, please. We, we need that. However, if those do not resonate, it doesn't make you less than or it doesn't mean that you're compromising your Reiki training. Not at all. You still have the gift of Reiki to use in your personal life, with your family and friends, with whoever you choose to share it and whatever way you choose to share it. It cannot be used for anything unhealthy or incompatible. It only is there for good. So however you use Reiki is the way that is right for you. So please, if you've ever thought that you didn't want to pursue the full master teacher training because you didn't want to teach, well, you can take a lesson from Andrea and myself. I did not want to teach either, even after I had taken the master teacher training. I could have said what Andrea said. When I do something, I go all in. I want it all. I wanted to get the full boat, you know, all the Reiki energy I could, all the tools, all the techniques, all the knowledge, and I'm still learning about Reiki. But for a good two years, maybe, I didn't want to teach, and I never intended to. So we just never know what's waiting for us on the Reiki journey. Don't be hesitant to go for that extra Reiki training if it resonates. Again, if it doesn't, don't. We have to honor ourselves. That is my message. Honor yourself. At the end of the day, that's what's most important. It is. Being our authentic self and inviting Reiki along with that, along with expressing from that place of truth and authenticity. It's beautiful. Imagine a world where the garbage collector had Reiki, where your veterinarian had Reiki, where your babysitter for your children has Reiki. And isn't that wonderful? We want Reiki to be wherever you are, alongside you in your life that makes you happy. And so having a business all about Reiki, that isn't the answer, not the answer for all people. And to elevate the world and help heal the world, it makes sense that Reiki would be in all of these other places alongside all of these other people being themselves. Yes, Reiki is going to be with you regardless of how you use it. And when you think of the potential for the experiences you'll have as a Reiki practitioner, it becomes even more incumbent upon the potential student to do their homework before choosing a teacher because you want to receive the optimal benefit from that class, whatever the benefit is for you. Again, we're going to go back to that. It's individual. So I can't sit here and say, yes, you need to take X, Y, and Z course or A, B, and C course. I can't do that, and I would not do that. Only you can make that final decision. But please do it in a way that honors who you are, honors your authenticity, and honors your life as a spiritual being having a human experience. Regardless of the path you choose with Reiki, it will be there with you every step of the way. 
just know that to be true because it is. I'd like to bring up the idea about respect for Reiki, the system of Reiki, and when someone is looking at learning Reiki, then it is deserving of our respect, both from the teacher's perspective, I believe, but also the potential student. And so I would ask the potential student to, you had mentioned, go within and consider if it's right for them. Well, let's take Mm -hmm. that one step further. The potential student can then ask within themselves, if Reiki is worthy to learn, what is a worthy method for me to learn? What is right? What shows respect for this almost now 100-year-old practice, at least in the lineage of Usui? Is an in-person class, does that resonate? Does that mean to me that that shows respect? Does an online class also offer that? Can both do that? If I watch a video on YouTube, which they do have, you know, if I watch an hour long video and I'm supposed to be able to practice Reiki level one after that, is that respectful to the system of Reiki? Is that the sort of practitioner that I want to be? And is that how I want to present myself as a Reiki practitioner? Because if we go out into the world and share Reiki with other people, the natural question would be, oh, and how did you learn Reiki? And I would ask that potential student to reflect upon how they might answer that question. What is the seriousness of their training? How did they approach that? And is it an honor to be attuned to Reiki? And I would invite them to ask those sorts of questions for themselves. Yes, you make a very good point, Andrea. I think the respect for Reiki is necessary. And also, I use the word reverence. It is a gift from spirit. And I think that requires some reverence. And I don't mean that to sound all, you know, religious or anything, but it is a powerful, beautiful gift from spirit. It does require some reverence. At least that's the way I look at it. I think that's important as well. And something else you just said brought something to mind, and that is someone is contemplating taking Reiki so that they can practice professionally. I think one of the things to consider is, all right, I plan to have clients and practice this professionally. I want to know that my clients will feel comfortable with me as a practitioner and that I have received the appropriate training so that I can do the optimal benefit for them in a session. I think that's something to consider because, and you had brought that up in a previous conversation between ourselves, and I thought it was a wonderful point. Oh, yes. You know, the reverence you talk about? Absolutely. I have always felt honored when someone came in for a Reiki session. Just imagine this for a moment. Someone I've never met comes to my office. We speak just for a few minutes about Reiki and about the session. And then they lay down on a Reiki table, completely vulnerable, opening their energy bodies to me. And that is a huge deal. That is very intimate. And I do not take that lightly. I don't take Reiki training lightly. I don't take Reiki lightly. I'm pretty serious about it. But my point in this is, if I were to go receive a Reiki treatment from someone as the client, I view it that way. I view it as opening myself up to this person. And I want a practitioner who has invested time, energy, attention, and introspection, deep thought, and concern in their training so that I know that this is not a passing fad for this practitioner. I want my practitioner to honor Reiki and to feel honored that I'm there asking them to help me in that way. This is not something to take lightly. And as a practitioner or a potential practitioner, 
I think that that's extremely important to put ourselves on the other side, put ourselves in our client's shoes. Who would we want to be working on our energy? Who would we want to be tinkering around with that? It's an important thing to consider when you start looking at training. That's very important. And looking at it from a potential client perspective, oh yes, it is a very intimate, energetic connection. The client and the practitioner alone in the healing space, and as you said, lying on a Reiki table, or even if they're sitting in a chair in some instances, it's still a very intimate exchange of energy and they are vulnerable, as you said. So as a potential client, you want to know that the practitioner who is initiating this intimate exchange has the proper tools and the techniques and the knowledge and has invested the time, the energy, and the effort to provide the best benefit for you that he or she can. I think that's incredibly important. And that's something else that people who are interested in learning Reiki need to ask themselves. How do I want to use this? And how would I feel as a client if I took this course? Or how would I feel if I took this course? And be honest with yourself. Ask yourself honest questions and go within. Do a little deep diving into how you really feel about Reiki and take it from there. And can you provide Reiki with the respect and, yes, the reverence that it deserves? That's also an important question. Yeah, and I do want to be a little bit understanding, though, too, because I know for myself, when I first came to Reiki, I didn't know anything about it. And I said yes to Reiki 1, very lighthearted. I didn't understand it at all. Reiki kind of found me, and I've talked about that before. And I really had no expectation of anything about where it would go. And so I understand that there are probably people out there, too, that they're curious about Reiki um, and we're talking all serious and all that. And they might not even consider yet like what they might do with it. They just really might want to learn more about it, which might lead them to something like a webinar or that YouTube video thing that I mentioned earlier. And so I want to say, I don't think there's anything wrong with that stuff. I think it can be valuable as a first step on the Reiki path. So you might watch the YouTube video, uh, but let's just be real. You know, I don't think anybody is expecting, hopefully, to watch a YouTube video and then they're going to go open a Reiki practice on the corner and actually see clients or teach classes. I think people are pretty realistic, hopefully, about what they're investing in the training and what they're going to be able to do after. In my classes, I have seen students come and they say, you know, I'm in this class because I wanted to learn Reiki. And I started with this webinar thing and I did the webinar and it was pretty good, but it was really lacking. And so while I learned some things about Reiki, I did realize that there was a lot more to learn, that it didn't really answer a whole lot of my questions. So I'm glad I took that because I understand a little bit more and it really lit more of a fire in me that I knew then I wanted better training. That's why I'm here with you. So I do think that these other ways of learning can actually be a really good first step. What do you think, Kathleen? I think you nailed it. That's absolutely right. Everything has value in some way or other, and I think that's important to keep in mind, not just Reiki training or Reiki practitioners. Everything and everyone has value. So using those webinars, um, brief YouTube videos as a first step is actually brilliant because that will give the potential student a little more information and help him or her decide if this is something they want to move forward with. Now, my introduction to Reiki was a little bit different than yours because I had someone who was taking her first Reiki class and she came to visit me one day and was just 
going on and on about how wonderful it was and how it was changing her life and how much she loved it. And that really sparked my curiosity because I was going through a rather difficult time in my life then. And I thought, boy, I could really use some of that <laughs> for some stress relief, honestly, was my first thought. And before you know it, a couple of weeks later, I found myself in my first Reiki class. So I just went right from not knowing really anything about Reiki to taking my first Reiki class based on the word of mouth and a recommendation from someone that I am very close to and trust completely. That's how I ended up taking Reiki. But for those who may not have that type of encounter, as I did, or even for someone who just wants a little more information, I think you said it beautifully. It's a great first step. Dip your toe in the water and see if Reiki feels right to you. That may help you answer some of those questions you have for yourself. Just taking a little peek into what Reiki's all about. And if you go, yeah, you know, as Andrea said, I really want to know more about this. This is really interesting. Then go for it. So there's many ways to approach a Reiki class or Reiki training, and probably as many ways to approach it as there are individuals. But I think it's up to us as individuals to find the way forward that's right for us. I hope that what we've talked about here today gives you some idea of the kinds of things to ask yourself going forward and some of the things to consider when you're interested or thinking about going with Reiki training. I sure hope that what we've discussed today is helpful for that gentleman who asked the question and also our listeners, give them some food for thought. I also want to thank those who have given us coffee, made donations along the way for us for helping us bring the podcast to you every other Wednesday. Listen for our new episodes. If you'd like to support us that way, find a link in the show notes and we look forward to connecting with you again. We thank you again for joining us. And of course, we invite you to join us next time as we journey beyond the Reiki Gateway with Kathleen Johnson and Andrea Kennedy.